Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here, and it is such a joy to have you worshiping with us today at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Our hope is that this will be a meaningful time for you, that in the next hour you will be transformed by God's love and will encounter the Holy Spirit. As we begin our time of worship, please join me in a word of prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today. We thank you that you are beyond the bounds of space and time, and so it's possible for us to worship together with you in the communion of saints, even online. Would you open up our ears to hear your word and open up our hearts to receive your love? We do love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to light the Advent candle, I've invited my friend Ryan Mansberry, who is our AV and sound person here at the church, to, uh, to assist me today. Our scripture comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. We light this candle, the candle of hope, as we begin the season of Advent together. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
And now we have the great privilege of talking to God through prayer. And as we pray, I'm going to pause in the prayer and indicate when you can speak the names of those that you wish to lift up in prayer today. You may name them in your heart or speak them out loud. Let us pray. Lord God, Father of all mercies, we come before you today acknowledging that we are your unworthy servants. And we give you thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may love one another as Jesus loves us. We pray for comfort and healing for all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and may they know the joy of your salvation. We especially pray for these whose names we bring before you now as we name them in our hearts or out loud. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Lord, you have called us to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We pray for those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. In these challenging times in which we live, help us, O Lord, to always show forth your love and grace through our lives. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. And now as God's confident children, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us reflect for a moment on our worship through giving. The psalmist said in Psalm 54, Behold, God is my helper. God is the upholder of my life. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O God, for it is good. For you have delivered me from every trouble. Giving is an integral part of biblical worship. We give out of gratitude for all uh, that with which God has blessed us. You can worship God through your giving by coming to live worship, leaving a check in the offering plate at the sanctuary exits, also by mailing a check or by giving through our website or the cell phone app. Let us pray. All things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a blessing from you. Living and loving God, accept all that we offer you as we worship you in our giving. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
Hi, I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. And it's my joy now to be able to share the children's message today. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching the video, now's a great time to call them over for the children's message. So today in the Christian year, in the Christian calendar, is the first Sunday of Advent. Now, do you know what that means? Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. That means that it's only a little over four weeks until Christmas gets here. Wow, that's exciting. And I'm beginning to get into the spirit of Christmas already, you know, thinking about gifts that I want to give people, thinking about decorations that I want to put up. Have, have you started decorating at your house? Okay, you have your tree up already? Oh, I, I don't quite have mine up yet. How about outside decoration? Oh, okay, you've, got, you've already got outside decorations up. Lights around the house or maybe a, lights in a tree in the front yard. Well, you know, Christmas lights are a big part of decoration for Christmas and a big part of our uh, celebration. So I've got my lights today, and let me get them turned on. And you see, I'm already getting into the Christmas spirit because I have my Christmas lights. And I'll, well, I won't wear them all the time during the next four weeks, but I'll wear these lights some of the time. Uh, because Christmas lights are a very important part of our Christmas celebration. They remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. That's what he, he said about himself. He said, I am the light of the world. And, and he goes on to talk about how the light has shone in the darkness and the darkness is not able to overcome it or put it out. And... Another thing about Christmas lights is that they remind us that Christmas is coming sooner rather than later. That means that pretty soon, in just a few short weeks, we will be celebrating the birthday of Jesus. Now, how do you plan to celebrate Jesus' birthday this year? Uh, will you have a birthday cake for Jesus? Hey, you could. It's a possibility. Some families uh, do that. What gift will you give to Jesus for his birthday? You know, at Christmas time, we talk about what we want. I want for Christmas, or, or somebody gave me. What did you get for Christmas? But the real spirit of Christmas is about giving. And so now is a good time to start thinking about what will I give to Jesus as a birthday present. Of course, the best thing you can give to Jesus is to open your heart to his love and invite him to be your Lord and Savior. We also give gifts to Jesus when we do acts of kindness for other people, when we help other people in need. And so you'll have opportunities during this season of Advent to give Jesus a birthday present by doing something nice and helpful for others. So let's, above all else, remember every time we see Christmas lights that Jesus is the light of the world, that his birthday is coming. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the children and youth of our church and all those who are watching this video today. We pray your blessings on them and their families. Help us to truly celebrate the birthday of Jesus this Christmas season, the light of the world. Help us to be especially thoughtful about giving Jesus presents for his birthday. In his name we pray, amen. Good morning and grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I'm so glad you took the time to join us on this first Sunday of Advent as we begin the new Christian year together. 
Our first scripture for the new year comes from the prophet Jeremiah. We're going to pick up in chapter 33, beginning in verse 14. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to make grain offerings, and to make sacrifices for all time. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Most holy and gracious God, Lord, as we begin this season of Advent, help us to prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Christ. Lord, we ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Well, we've scarcely had time to savor Thanksgiving, right? The delicious turkey and dressing. You may still have some leftovers in your fridge. The football games on TV, the reunions with family and friends that you may still be cleaning up from. The brisk cold of an autumn afternoon, the annual flotilla lighting up the waters at Wrightsville Beach. For the children, the coming of Christmas has always signaled a flood of expectations. Santa Claus is already setting up his listening posts at different place, places around town. And some may complain about the over-commercialization of Christmas, but not me. Now, I certainly don't want us to overlook the real reason for the season, but I love to see those little eyes light up as they rush into the living room to see what the jolly old elf has brought them this year. Well, we're still almost four weeks away from that blessed event, but today begins that season in the church year that's designed to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. And it's never too early to begin preparing for that. This time of year, there are usually two kinds of sales that are advertised on TV, newspapers, or social media. You have your post-Thanksgiving sales and your pre-Christmas sales. And I couldn't help but wonder if those two terms don't describe the spiritual state of many of us. Post-Thanksgiving and pre-Christmas. Permit me to cite some examples. If we only obey the law and do nothing more, our faith is pre-Christmas. How's that for a starter? If most of us were brought before the heavenly court today and were asked to defend ourselves before the righteous judge of the universe, I suspect that most of us would start off by naming the things we haven't done. Let us see. Thou shalt not kill. All right, I got that one. I haven't killed anybody. I'm good. Thou shalt not steal. Well, I don't do that either, or lie, or cheat, or mistreat my parents, or most of us would take refuge in the things we don't do. And yet if we obey the law, and that's all we do, our faith is pre-Christmas. You know what's interesting when you read the Gospels? You'll find that Jesus spends very little time condemning evildoers. Instead, he spends a great deal of time condemning good folks who aren't doing enough or simply have missed the point. For example, the priest and the Levite who pass by the man lying in the ditch. They may have kept their laws, but their faith was pre-Christmas. Or the rich young ruler who kept all the commandments from his youth on up. Jesus told him there was still one more thing he lacked. He needed to take everything he had and sell it and give the money to the poor and leave it behind and follow Jesus. Because being good wasn't good enough. Or the goats at the last judgment. Eternal fire was prepared, not for those who'd broken the laws of adultery, stealing, and killing. Rather, it was prepared for those who had a chance to give a cup of water to a man who was thirsty, or a piece of bread to a man who was hungry, or clothing to the naked, or to make a simple visit to the sick or imprisoned. Chances came time and time again for these folks, and they let those chances slip away unfulfilled. How about you? Are you willing to go beyond respectable and become responsible? 
A lawyer asked Jesus, what was the greatest commandment? Jesus didn't answer with thou shalt not. He summed up all of Christian living with thou shalt. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And thy shalt, Lord, excuse me, thy shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Who was your neighbor? Jesus answered a story about a good Samaritan who took time to minister to a total stranger in need. We need more good Samaritans. You may have heard the story about a woman who rounded the street corner and came upon an accident victim lying on the sidewalk. Suddenly, she was grateful for that first aid course that she'd recently completed at the local YMCA. I was going for a walk today, she told her husband later, and I saw this poor man lying on the sidewalk in pretty bad condition. Then she continued, all my first aid training came back to me, and I knew just what to do. I bent right down and put my head between my knees to keep from fainting. That's a lot of us. An article in the Christian Herald states that one of the best apartments in New York is near the banks of the East River. Yet the living room windows face to the west, away from the river. You see, when the buildings were erected in 1925, animal pens and a large slaughterhouse were inside of the apartment. So the planners gave the owners a more desirable view. This happens to people. Instead of changing the circumstances and improving the conditions, we simply turn away or we put our head between our knees to keep from fainting. This is how we've dealt with immigrant labor camps, with prison reform, with city slums. We've just looked in another direction. But Christ calls us to be servants, and servants do the work. Our faith is pre-Christmas if we only obey the law. In the second place, our faith is pre-Christmas if we only love those people who love us. Everybody loves people who love them. That doesn't take any great act of commitment. There was once a fellow who was known as kind of a general ne'er-do-well. He never contributed anything to his community. Now, he wasn't malicious. He was simply lazy, or what some would call worthless. Still, most members of the community were fairly charitable when describing him. After all, they would say, he was good to his mother. Well, everyone's good to their mother. Well, not everyone, of course. There are some bums out there, and I'm sure I could visit mine more than I do. Still, it takes no great leap of devotion to love your mother or your brother or people who go to the same church as you or live on the same street as you. Everybody does that. They even say that about the mafia. You know, they really take care of their own. Well, it may be true. Jesus said, even the Gentiles love those who love them. The test of Christian faith is whether you can love persons whom ordinarily you might not even be able to stand. The cause of Christ has been crippled through the years by those who say they love Christ, but cannot love humanity. The world sniffs out hypocrisy in the church quicker than a bear sniffs out a picnic at a state park. In his autobiography, Mahatma Gandhi tells of his interest in the Bible when he was a student. He even attended a Christian church one time. When he entered the sanctuary, the ushers refused to seat him. They suggested he go worship with his own people. Gandhi was so disillusioned, he left and later wrote, If Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain Hindu. So sad. By the way, how are we doing so far? Our faith is pre-Christmas if all we do is obey the law and do no more. And our faith is pre-Christmas if we only love those people who love us. Finally, our faith is pre-Christmas if it has never made that vital move from our lips to our hearts. We get disturbed because Christmas has been so captured by our culture that it's almost lost its religious significance. But the bigger problem is that the Christian faith is rapidly being captured by a culture that doesn't care altogether. The problem isn't that people say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. It's that people no longer speak to one another at all. We live in fear of one another, so we avoid each other. We've forgotten how to be kind and generous and helpful. We'd rather confront one another than to comfort one another. How about you? Do you have Christ on your lips, but not in your heart? 
And when these things begin to take place, Jesus says, look up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Remember the description of the prodigal son's change of heart? He came to himself, the Bible says. The following is an account of a young man whose life history was the subject of a government report on juvenile delinquency. It said a young man who was a very serious problem to his parents and to local authorities because of his antisocial behavior spent several weeks one summer in a peaceful rural area with members of a religious group well known for their kind, simple mode of living. His behavior among them was exemplary. The following summer, after yet another violent year in his economically depressed neighborhood, he returned back to the country and to his peaceful, friendly mode of living and added the comment, the real me is here. Perhaps we've missed the whole point of Christmas and Christianity. For no longer shall we be dependent on an external law, but rather upon an indwelling spirit. The surest testimony might just be this one. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Our faith is pre-Christmas, if it is a faith of the lips and not of the heart. This is to say that our faith is still pre-Christmas if we've never made a commitment of our life to Jesus Christ. I don't know if this is true or not, but I once heard a story of a Methodist minister who called his bishop and told her that Jesus Christ was visiting his church in person that day and asked what he should do. She said, look busy. We're a busy people. We're even busy about the things of God. And yet busyness is not the key to the kingdom of God. Now we're going to talk about that more next week. Our lives may still be fragmented. Our busyness lacking focus. Our vision lacking in power, purpose, and promise. Why? Because we've never given it all to Christ. What did Pastor Julia call it last week? Functional atheism. The Bethlehem babe laid in a manger provides the answer to the space that separates us from God. Indeed, as the Christian community attempted to understand and explain the Christmas event, they described it as the veritable meeting of God and humanity in one person, the incarnation. That's what they called it. God revealing himself through the life of a human being is what that means. Emmanuel is what they called him, which means God with us. The fact of Christ, writes Dr. Carnegie Simpson, does not indeed show us everything, but it shows us one thing we need to know. That's the character of God. God is the God who sent Jesus, and that God is love. Jesus not only showed us that the nature of God was love, he also showed us that we are important in God's eyes. In fact, while Jesus may be the reason for the season, we are the reason for Jesus. And we've heard it said, Christmas begins in the heart of God. It's only complete when it reaches the heart of each one of us. Is your faith pre-Christmas? If your faith is but a tradition that you follow, a law that you obeyed, and a creed that you espouse, but it never calls you to change, or to do anything different for anyone else, is it any different from a person who has no faith at all? Christ calls you this day to open your heart, to let his love come in, that in turn you may also love others, and that you might make a commitment of yourself to his will and to his way. Let us spend Advent this year thinking about how we can receive Jesus, not just with our lips, but with our hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, by now we have heard the news, the good news, that Jesus has come into the world. Help us not to live simply as people who've never heard of this event, who've never heard of Christ, but help us to be changed so that we might change the world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we go through the season of Advent this year, let us think about the difference that Jesus makes in our life. In a pre-Christmas life, before Jesus comes, we live by the law and nothing else. In a pre-Christmas life, we love only those people who love us as well. In a pre-Christmas life, our faith comes simply in what we say, but not in what we do. Let's realize that Jesus has come to change the world and has invited us to be part of that. As we invite him to be our Savior, may we also invite him to be our Lord. And let's make a difference in this world. Go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. May the Lord